Throughout the glorious and terrible history of conquest, one name towers above all others. One warrior, one king, one legend, Alexander the Great. Never in all the world was there another like him. Born of a ruthless mother. He believed that she was a consort of some higher being. Educated by a brilliant philosopher. One of the most influential thinkers in the world, Aristotle. Driven by a domineering father. They swiftly drew their swords. Then the blood really flowed. A Macedonian warrior at 14, a general at 18, king at 20, commanding 40,000 troops hungry for total war leaving a grand legacy and a controversial history that endure to this day. More than 2,000 years ago, this was the home of a man who many consider to be the greatest warrior in history. We are in northern Greece, at the remains of the ancient city of Pella, where once stood the palace of King Philip II of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. In the fourth century BC, Alexander was raised here to conquer the world. We are going to explore the journey of those conquests, which span 12 years, 22,000 miles, and cover the territories of what are now Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. We're going to examine the complex personality of a man who may have considered himself to be a god, and yet who died a mere mortal at the age of 32. Like Alexander, we too have a mission, to answer questions that have been debated by historians for centuries. Who was Alexander? What drove him on? And how could he, at such a young age, have conquered such a vast empire? Most of what we know about Alexander the Great comes from four ancient historians who wrote several hundred years after Alexander died in 323 BC. They based their manuscripts on the journals of men who lived and fought alongside the legendary warrior. The historians include Arian, a Greek author and statesman, Diodorus of Sicily, Curtius Rufus of Rome, and the Greek philosopher Plutarch, the only writer to document Alexander's boyhood and devote considerable time to analyzing his character. When a portrait painter sets out to create a likeness, he relies above all upon the face and the expression of the eyes and pays less attention to the other parts of the body. In the same way, it is my task to dwell upon those actions which illuminate the workings of the soul. And so we begin the astonishing tale of one man whose short life of 32 years gave him historic immortality. It is 356 BC, the year of Alexander's birth. In an area of northern Greece known as Macedonia, or Macedon, King Philip II rules a population that other Greeks consider inferior. We get this impression that the Macedonians are barely literate, that they are boorish, that they are beneath the high level of culture that is uh, exhibited by many Athenians, and, and furthermore, that they're dangerous, as represented by the king, Philip II. But the Macedonians are very wealthy. They control areas filled with gold and silver mines. Philip exploits these riches to the fullest. He assembles, trains, and equips an army that is one of the finest in the world. The reign of Philip was a developing awful shock for them that this disorganized Macedonian kingdom had suddenly become organized. Thanks to the mines, it had enormous economic power. But where there is power, there is also passion. In 357 BC, at age 26, Philip becomes passionately involved with a young woman named Olympias from the Greek region of Epirus. He asks her hand in marriage, and Olympias agrees, 
to become one of his numerous brides. He certainly did have the reputation of he married a fresh wife with every campaign he undertook. The object of that remark being uh, that he wanted to make himself diplomatically safe by contracting these various alliances. Philip is smitten with the beauty of Olympias, but he is not fully aware that she has an eccentric, wild side, associating herself with mystic cults and mythologies. She's a fiery character, and she is political, she is religious, but above all, she's dynastic. Make no mistake about it, Olympias' main interest throughout her life was clearly getting her son, Alexander, onto the throne. I think she was, as far as the succession of her son, Alexander, was concerned, absolutely ruthless. Philip's marriage to Olympias brings the king greater worries and challenges than he ever faced on a field of battle. On the night before the marriage was consummated, the bride dreamed that her womb was struck by a thunderbolt. Philip saw himself in a dream, in the act of sealing up his wife's womb, and upon the seal there was the figure of a lion. At another time, a serpent was seen stretched out at Olympias' side as she slept. And this weakened Philip's passion and cooled his affection for her. From that time on, he seldom came to sleep with her. Either he was afraid she would cast some evil spell upon him, or else he believed that she was a consort of some higher being. The relationship between Philip and Olympias is destined to be a tumultuous one. Philip himself secretly witnesses this serpent lying in bed with Olympias. The experience concerns him greatly, as the king of all Greek gods, Zeus, is frequently represented in the form of a serpent. Philip feels a burning desire to find out if the child to be born to Olympias was fathered by himself, or possibly, though unimaginably, by Zeus. There is only one place for Philip to obtain an answer, the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi. This is how Delphi appeared in the fourth century BC, a bustling center of worship, commerce, and athletic competition. This is Delphi today. The columns of the Temple of Apollo still stand majestically on a magnificent hillside overlooking the Gulf of Corinth. For us, when we hear the word, the Oracle of Delphi, what we understand is the place. The person is the prophet. What she told us was a prophecy. So that's the holy place that is dedicated to Apollo. And Apollo was the sun god, the god of music and poetry. On the other hand, in Delphi, Apollo could tell people the future, so he had that special charisma. Therefore, we call it an oracle. So that's the oracle of Delphi. Inside the oracle, you can see the treasuries, the statues, the dedications, the temple. That's the most important building. Underneath was the cellar, the holy room. Aviton, there was the priestess. From there, she would tell people the future. In the months before Alexander's birth in 356 BC, there is only one question that Philip wants to ask the oracle at Delphi. Will his child be the son of a mortal or a god? Philip sends an emissary here to Delphi to consult with the oracle of Apollo about the meaning of what he has witnessed. The oracle, while not directly acknowledging that Alexander would be the son of a god, tells Philip to make sacrifices to Zeus and to revere him above all other deities. 
The oracle adds that Philip will lose the sight of the eye with which he peered through into the bedroom and saw Olympias with the serpent. A prophecy which is fulfilled two years later when Philip is seriously wounded in battle. Stories such as this, reported by ancient historians, are viewed with skepticism today. Everybody says, oh, well, you know, you look through the keyhole and there is your wife frolicking around with a great anaconda. Um, you know, it tends, perhaps, to sort of put you off your mark a little. Regardless of his status as a deity, the child born to Olympias during the summer of 356 BC is destined to bring triumph and tragedy to his homeland, his family, and himself as Alexander the Great. At the time of Alexander the Great's birth in 356 BC, the troops of Philip II are engaged in expanding his kingdom. Two cities in the Macedonian region of northern Greece are prominent. Aegi, now called Vergina, is the first Macedonian capital and continues to be an active place of ancestral worship, politics, and art. Remains of a large palace still exist, as well as an outdoor theater where celebrations, performances, and athletic competitions are held. In the fourth century BC, Pella becomes the active Macedonian capital and home of King Philip II. This is where Alexander the Great grows up. He lives a life of royalty, but he is by no means a spoiled rich kid. His ambition and curiosity about the world are limitless. Alexander is a boy of incredible intellect. His favorite author is Homer, and he regularly sleeps with a copy of Homer's poems by his bedside. At Pella, he is educated in a school reserved for the children of Macedonian nobility. At this academy, he's given the finest training, academic, athletic, and military. But at the age of 13, an event occurs which convinces Philip that his son's intelligence is only surpassed by his courage. There came a day when Philonicus the Thessalian brought Philip a horse named Bucephalus, which he offered to sell for 13 talents. The king and his friends went down to the plain to watch the horse's trials and came to the conclusion that he was wild and unmanageable. Philip ordered it to be led away. But Alexander, who was standing close by, remarked, what a horse they're losing, and all because they do not know how to handle him or dare not try. Alexander went quickly up to Bucephalus, took hold of his bridle, and turned him towards the sun, for he had noticed that the horse was shying at the sight of his own shadow. Alexander vaulted safely to his back. He urged him forward, using a commanding voice and a touch of the foot. At first, Philip and his friends held their breath and looked on in an agony of surprise until they saw Alexander right back, triumphant. His father, we are told, actually wept for joy. When Alexander had dismounted, he kissed him and said, My boy, you must find a kingdom big enough for your ambitions. Macedonia is too small for you. Whether fact or fiction, legend has it that Bucephalus becomes Alexander's favorite horse, one he ultimately rides into battle for years to come. King Philip is so impressed with his son, he decides that the teachers at the Macedonian court do not provide him with the intellectual challenge he deserves. Philip brings in a new tutor, a man who has gone down in history as one of the most influential thinkers in the world, Aristotle. Philip also provides his son with a magical environment in which to learn. This is the precinct of the nymphs at Mieza, part of the legendary gardens of Midas. These streams, grottos, and shaded walks were believed to be sacred to the nymphs, mythological goddesses who were the spirits of nature. According to Plutarch, 
Alexander used to say that his father, Philip, had given him the gift of life, but Aristotle had taught him how to live well. Each day as a young teenager, Alexander would walk this path towards the cave where Aristotle teaches. Aristotle was one of the widest ranging minds that ever lived. A philosopher whose teachings covered ethics, politics, music, medicine, embryology, astronomy, botany, magnets, optics, history, zoology, rhetoric, poetry, and most important, curiosity. He teaches Alexander to make no assumptions. Every situation is different. Organize, analyze the facts before drawing conclusions. Add this to Alexander's natural spontaneity and you have a recipe for genius. It is at this time, when Alexander moves from adolescence into manhood, that he meets Hephaestion, the son of a Macedonian nobleman. Hephaestion ultimately becomes Alexander's closest friend, and many believe an intimate companion. As Alexander was growing into a teenager, both Philip and Olympias were scared that he was growing up as what the Greeks call a guinness, which is a femme homosexual. And in order to put him right, what they both suggested was importing high-class call girls to show him what he should be up to. And it does raise the question of what do you do if you are a slightly feminine youth with an ultra-masculine, heavily bearded, militarily successful, hard-drinking, dominant alpha male father. And it does make one wonder um, whether the lifelong devotion and friendship that he had with Hephaestion was with the one person with whom he could relax and be himself. What really motivated Alexander, which is I think what everyone coming to grips with him has to realize, is he enjoyed the problems involved in putting together a massive army and using that massive army to gain strategic objectives. That's what turned him on in a sort of brutal way. You could say killing other armies is what really turned him on. And for him, that was much more of a rush than the kind of rush he got from sex. It is believed that the philosophy of Aristotle, the warrior instinct of Philip, and the passion for mythology of Olympias combined to create the extraordinary human being, Alexander. He would soon have his first chance to prove himself on a battlefield, but he would also make an enemy of his own father. In 340 BC, King Philip II of Macedon, father of 16-year-old Alexander, is at war. His goal, to control Greece. The Macedonian phalanx is Philip's most powerful tool of war. Highly trained soldiers carrying pikes or sarasus, marching in tight formation, a massive moving war machine, practically unstoppable. Philip adapted the formation from the traditional Greek phalanx. The main difference with Philip's phalanx is the fact that the body armor of the individual infantry soldier is less, but it's compensated for by the fact that the soldier carries a pike. The pike is between 15 and 18 feet long. It's got a counterweight on the end, which is closest to the soldier, which allows the fulcrum to move back so that the end of the pike can be lifted. Now, of course, if you've got a pike that's 15 to 18 feet long, you have to drill those men extremely well so that they can move them around. If you are faced with a Macedonian phalanx, you are faced with a front thousands wide. With these pikes, you had this enormous hedge of lethal steel coming at you, and you just couldn't reach 
the opposition with your own much shorter thrusting shields. So provided the phalanx kept level, and it could just literally walk through any opposition, which it did. By the time Alexander turns 16, Philip controls most of Greece. But when news of each additional triumph reaches Alexander, he shows no pride. Whenever he heard that Philip had captured some famous city or won an overwhelming victory, Alexander would show no pleasure at the news, but would declare to his friends, boys, my father will forestall me in everything. There will be nothing great or spectacular for you and for me to show to the world. Alexander had no desire to inherit a kingdom which offered him riches, luxuries, and the pleasure of the senses. His choice was a life of struggle, of wars, and of unrelenting ambition. At the ancient Macedonian capital of Aegae, in 339 BC, Alexander spends much time studying the records and accounts of his father's exploits. It is obvious to many that he grows increasingly anxious to engage in battle, and that one day he will lead his own conquests. On one occasion when Philip is away from Aegee, some ambassadors from Persia arrive. Alexander receives them in his father's place and impresses them greatly with his intelligence, his maturity, and his knowledge of politics. They come away convinced that Philip's reputation for astuteness is nothing compared to the adventurous spirit and dangerous ambitions of his son. But Philip also continues to have ambition, to control Greece. Standing in his way are his two most formidable opponents, the armies of Thebes and Athens. In particular, a unique group of soldiers has a ferocious reputation. The sacred band of Thebes is made up of 150 couples of male lovers who eat together, sleep together, and fight together, never retreating, always fighting to the death. To further challenge Philip, the Thebans and Athenians had been supported with weapons, soldiers, and money from Persia. Considered the world's most powerful nation, the Persian king knows that if Philip completes his conquest of Greece, he has Persia in his sights. Philip's motive is revenge for a generation of Persian meddling in the political affairs of both Greece and Macedon. The Persian rulers would be pleased to see Philip's ambition halted by the troops of Thebes and Athens. The showdown is to occur at a place called Chaeronea in central Greece. Today, a vast sea of cotton fields. A defeat for Philip would mean the end of his conquests. A victory would motivate him to move his army toward Asia. In August 338 BC, the day arrives for the battle at Chaeronea to take place. Alexander is 18. Philip decides it is time for his son to become a Macedonian commander. He places him in charge of the companion cavalry a force of 2,000 horsemen who always perform a key strategic role in Philip's battles, attacking the enemy from a flank position. It is with the battle at Chaeronea that the historian Diodorus begins his accounts of Alexander's life. The armies deployed at dawn, and the king stationed his son Alexander, young in age, but noted for his valor and swiftness of action, on one wing, placing beside him his most seasoned generals, while he himself, at the head of picked men, exercised the command over the other. Individual units were stationed where the occasion required. On the other side, dividing the line according to nationality, the Athenians assigned one wing to the Thebans and kept command of the others themselves. I am standing on the site of the Battle of Chaeronea. King Philip begins the battle by sending his Macedonian phalanx forward. They smash into the Athenian left wing. 
Suddenly, the signal to retreat is given. Now, for a massed phalanx of infantry to move backwards, keeping formation, is an almost impossible achievement, only made possible because these are the finest infantry troops in the world. The Athenians and their allies now move forwards and left across the battlefield towards the apparently retreating Macedonians. But the Thebans, the more disciplined troops, stay where they are, which turns out to be a mistake, because between the Thebans and the allies, a gap opens up. And that gap is seen by Alexander. He's waiting with the cavalry. When he sees that gap, he charges forward, smashes through it. He encircles the Thebans and is able to attack the allies in their flank. At the same time, the Macedonian phalanx now stops and starts to advance. They steamroll it through the Athenians, cut them down. 2,000 of them surrender. The Thebans are not so lucky. Completely surrounded by Alexander and his cavalry, they are killed almost to a man. Following the bloody battle in August 338 BC, the fields of Chaeronea are filled with carnage. Philip, with the aid of his son, achieves his goal of controlling Greece. The sacred band of Thebes is buried here, underneath the statue of a lion. The Athenian dead were cremated. The Battle of Chaeronea did two things. On a personal level, it proved Alexander to be an efficient and courageous commander of what was probably the finest cavalry force the world has ever seen. Politically, it established Philip's control over Athens and most of the Greek city-states. He could afford to be generous. He offered peace and the release of all prisoners. His terms were accepted. Alexander himself was sent with an honor guard to Athens, bearing the ashes of the Athenian dead. But relations between father and son were about to change. Never again would Philip trust Alexander with so important a task. The Battle of Chaeronea could have been the beginning of a father-son Macedonian dynasty. But the future holds in store a far different fate. One that inspires not mutual respect between Philip and Alexander, but hatred and distrust. By the fall of 338 BC, King Philip II of Macedon controls most of Greece. A decisive victory at Chaeronea in which Alexander plays a significant role defeating the Athenians, gives Macedonian troops respect for a new father-son leadership team. By the time Alexander reaches the age of 18, he has proven himself a worthy successor to his father's throne. He naturally assumes that this palace at Aegae will one day be his to rule and to call home. But a series of events alters those expectations, events prompted not by war, but by love. Within months of his victory at Chaeronea, Philip decides to take another bride. 20-year-old Cleopatra, from an elite Macedonian family, agrees to become his newest bride. I think it came down to the fact that here he is, a middle-aged man, and he finds himself uh, an appropriate young woman who will make a marriage alliance with a strong Macedonian family, and he went for it. Here we've got a guy who's almost 50 taking up with a woman who is, you know, 30 years his younger. So I'll, I'll let you draw the conclusions on that. Regardless of his reasoning, Philip's decision to wed Cleopatra creates a major rift with Alexander and his mother Olympias. Should the Macedonian Cleopatra give birth to a male child, the boy would take Alexander's place as legitimate heir to Philip's throne. For Alexander's mother is from Epirus, not part of Macedonia. Alexander, who had been brought up on the Iliad and the flattery of his tutors that he was a second Achilles fancied himself in the role. 
on the other hand, there was Daddy, who clearly had prior claim to the job, and now Daddy had remarried and was busy siring children on Cleopatra as fast as he could go. Growing tension between family members comes to a head on the couple's wedding night in the fall of 338 BC. The Macedonians were renowned for their drinking parties, many of which took place right here in the palace. Following the wedding of Philip and Cleopatra, the traditional Macedonian banquet takes place, at which all the men become seriously drunk. Atalus, the bride's uncle, raises a toast, praying that the gods may bless the union with the legitimate heir to the throne. Enraged, Alexander shouts out, what do you take me for, a bastard? He hurls a goblet of wine at Atalus. Philip stands, draws his sword, advances across the room towards his son, but he's so drunk that he trips and falls. Alexander jeers at his father, saying, here is the man who is planning to cross from Europe into Asia, and he cannot even cross from one table to another. This incident devastates a father-son relationship, which took 18 years to build. It destroys the potential of a military partnership upon which family dynasties are often founded. Following the scandalous wedding banquet, Alexander and his mother Olympias go into exile. But Philip soon realizes that the state needs a recognized heir to the throne, and he needs a valuable military commander. He convinces Alexander to return home. But Olympias does not return. Despite the reconciliation, there is no guarantee that Alexander will one day be king. Within a year of Philip's marriage, Cleopatra gives birth to a son. If Philip lives long enough, the throne will not go to Alexander. It will go to his half-brother, a purebred Macedonian. While the intense discord among Philip, Alexander, and Olympias is far from reconciled, Philip now focuses on his ultimate goal. With Greece under control, he considers expanding his kingdom into Asia. Philip sends a small expedition of troops under the command of his general Parmenio to Asia's western coast to assess obstacles and establish a bridgehead. Parmenio was his senior general, extremely important to him. He was his right-hand man, absolutely trusted. He was also a conniving political bastard of the first order, and his great advantage, clearly, was A, his absolute loyalty to Philip, and B, his undoubted extreme skill as a general. But before Philip himself risks the journey to Asia, he decides once again to consult the gods. Philip sends an emissary to Delphi to ask whether or not he will conquer Darius, the great king of Persia. The answer he receives is ambiguous. The bull is garlanded, the sacrifice is ready. Philip interprets this to mean that Darius will be slaughtered like a victim at the altar. The true fulfillment of the prophecy, however, turns out to be quite different. Straight away, Philip sets in motion plans for gorgeous sacrifices. He wanted as many Greeks as possible to take part in the festivities, so he planned brilliant musical contests and lavish banquets for his friends and guests. He was determined to show himself to the Greeks as an amiable person. Philip's celebration takes place on the palace grounds of the ancient capital city of Aegae. It is October of 336 BC. This is the theater in the grounds of the royal palace at Aegae. Here, thousands of Macedonians gather, together with King Philip and Alexander, for a festival in honor of the gods. Yeah. 
It's a happy occasion for all, except one man, Pausanias, a royal bodyguard. According to the ancient historian Diodorus, Pausanias is beloved by Philip because of his beauty. But when the king becomes enamored of another young man, Pausanias reacts poorly. He accuses the young man of being a promiscuous hermaphrodite. For this, Pausanias is punished. He is plied with wine until drunk. Unconscious, he is thrown to the king's mule drivers to abuse in drunken licentiousness. Later, he complains to Philip about this abuse, but the king takes no action against those responsible. In anger, Pausanias runs up to Philip, stabs him, and runs off. But he is killed before making his escape. Alexander rushes to his father, but it's too late. Philip dies in 336 BC. Conspiracy theories are immediately considered. Could Philip's wife, Olympias, have been involved to assure her son Alexander inheriting the throne? Could Alexander himself have played a role in planning the assassination? While such issues are investigated, an even more important question of urgency must be decided. Will Greece accept Alexander as its king? King Philip of Macedon is killed in 336 BC. There is no doubt that his own bodyguard dealt the fatal blow. But as with modern day murders attributed to lone assassins, questions arise about others being involved in the assassination plot. Conspiracy theories were thought of right from the beginning, particularly after Pausanias himself uh, was very conveniently assassinated uh, during the chase by Alexander's oldest school friends, which would have made it impossible for him to talk. The immediate suspicion fell on Olympias and through Olympias on Alexander, and the truth we're never going to know. After a ceremonial cremation, Philip's bones and most precious personal possessions are placed inside an elaborate burial chamber, which is then covered with tons of soil. By ancient custom, the higher the mound, the more important the person. Centuries later, archeologists would consider this fact when deciding where first to dig in an area of Vergina, Greece, not far from the ancient royal palace at Aegi. This is where King Philip II was buried, near his palace, underneath a man-made mound of earth which has become known as the Great Tumulus. The tomb itself remained hidden for more than 2,000 years until discovered in 1977 by the Greek archeologist Manolis Andronikos. 15 years later, a magnificent museum was built, literally, inside the tumulus. The Vergina Museum is a marvel of modern architecture and design, exquisitely exhibiting the items found in several tombs. This is the burial chamber of Philip II. When I first heard of this discovery, I could hardly believe it, and nor could many archaeologists. No Macedonian tomb on this scale had ever been discovered, but here it is. The facade is designed like a temple, a marble entrance flanked by two half columns or pilasters. Above the entrance is a frieze with the painting of a royal hunt. Philip is depicted hunting lion, boar, and other wild animals in a Macedonian forest. Here, a young man on horseback prepares to throw his weapon. This is Alexander himself. 
To discover the tomb of Alexander the Great's father was remarkable enough. But what the archaeologists were not prepared for, what no one could even have imagined, was the amazing treasure that they found inside. Incredibly, the actual bones of Philip II were found inside this solid gold case. Also inside the burial chamber, his gold-leafed crown. And war armor, including breastplates, helmets, and shields. Following his father's burial, Alexander immediately faces the greatest challenge of his young life, proving to the citizens of Macedonia that he deserves to be king. Alexander was only 20 years old when he inherited his kingdom, which at that moment was beset by formidable jealousies and feuds. Alexander's Macedonian advisors feared that a crisis was at hand and urged the young king to leave the Greek states to their own devices and refrain from using any force against them. Alexander, however, chose the opposite course and decided that the only way to make his kingdom safe was to act with audacity and a lofty spirit. He was certain that if he were to yield even a fraction of his authority, all his enemies would attack him at once. Within six months, Alexander leads the Macedonian army to regain control of Greece, earning the respect of his troops with decisive, courageous direction. To the horror of Cleopatra, who later commits suicide, Alexander's mother Olympias orders the execution of Philip's newborn son, leaving himself as the only possible heir to the Macedonian throne. King Alexander then turns his attention toward what would become his life's goal, the conquest of Persia. But first, in the tradition of his father, Alexander decides to seek counsel from the Oracle at Delphi to determine if he is indeed destined by the gods to defeat Darius and rule all of Asia. Unlike Philip, however, who always sent an emissary, Alexander goes himself in November of 335 BC. When Alexander arrives here at Delphi, he is told that he has come at the wrong time of year. The oracle cannot be consulted during the winter months. He must return in the spring. Alexander, not being one to take no for an answer, goes to the priestess and tries to drag her by force here to the temple. At last, overcome by his persistence, she cries out, You are invincible, my son. When he hears this, Alexander declares that he needs no other prophecy. He has obtained the answer he was seeking. As with many stories describing Alexander, it is difficult to separate myth from reality in the accounts of his visit to Delphi. But Alexander's passionate desire to please the gods and seek their guidance is a recurring theme in his life. As he is about to embark on what will be a 12-year journey, Alexander may or may not have a notion that he himself has some form of deified lineage. When he leaves for Asia, his mother Olympias tells him that upon his return, she will reveal an incredible secret about his life. Many believe Olympias will address the haunting question that only she can answer. Is Alexander the son of a god, or is he a mere mortal man? In 334 BC, King Philip II of Macedon is dead, assassinated by his own bodyguard. Conspiracy theories suggest that his wife Olympias and son Alexander may have been involved, but no one can say for certain. 
Alexander, at age 20, becomes king and wastes no time asserting his authority. He chooses to continue a massive offensive his father had begun, the conquest of Asia, and the defeat of the most powerful ruler on earth, Persian king Darius. He really had no choice but either to withdraw that force or reinforce it and have a full-scale war of annexation, which was, of course, the alternative that he chose. I don't think he ever thought of anything else. And I don't think, even from the beginning, that there was any limit on his ambition of conquest. Alexander's invasion starts with a daunting logistical maneuver, transporting his army of 40,000 across the body of water separating Europe and Asia, the Hellespont. Today, the Hellespont is known as the Dardanelles. Ferry boats travel back and forth across the strait. Here, Alexander's troops cross into Asia, transported on an assortment of man-powered rowing vessels. Moving such a massive force is fraught with peril due to the possibility of foul weather and the fact that the navy of Persian King Darius is three times as large. This is the Asian shore of the Hellespont. The current here is strong and the winds can be brutal. Alexander's ships could be very vulnerable to naval attack as they ferry the army across. But Alexander has two strokes of luck. The weather is fine, and the huge Persian fleet is far away, quelling a revolt in Egypt. Alexander doesn't hesitate. He's been dreaming of this moment, leading his troops into Asia to begin the conquest of the Persian Empire. He sets sail, halfway across, sacrificing a bull to the sea god Poseidon. He's first to set foot on the Asian shore, hurling his spear into the sand, claiming to receive Asia from the gods. He is not aware that nearby, the forces of Darius are gathering, determined that this should be Alexander's first and last trial of strength. Persian King Darius considers young Alexander an upstart to be quickly vanquished. The Persian ruler chooses not to waste his time commanding the troops himself. Instead, he sends his most trusted general Memnon, a Greek mercenary, who chooses a battleground where the terrain will work in his favor, the Granicus River. This is the Granicus today. In Alexander's time, it is three times as wide and deep. Alexander is accompanied by his own trusted advisors military commander Parmenio, his close friend Hephaestion, and Callisthenes, a nephew of Aristotle, who serves as Alexander's personal historian. On the high opposite bank of the Granicus River, the Persian army waits. With 20,000 cavalry and 20,000 infantry, many of them Greek mercenaries, Greek author and general Arian wrote about Alexander's first test of will. Parmenio came to Alexander and argued, we cannot take the army across the river on a broad front. A failure in our first action will at once have serious consequences and will put at risk the result of the whole war. Alexander replied, I know that, Parmenio, but I would be ashamed if I could cross the Hellespont easily and then found that this little stream could prevent us from crossing. It does not fit in with the way I react when I meet danger. Alexander proceeds to organize his army for a bold attack, one that many military leaders might consider foolhardy. Alexander plays a key role in the offensive, brazenly wearing a white-plumed helmet, marking him as the prime target of every enemy soldier. Alexander's battle strategy at the River Granicus utilizes tactics he learned from his father. 
thousands of highly trained soldiers on foot and horseback would boldly cross the river and meet the Persians head on. Alexander would cross the river upstream, leading his companion cavalry to attack the enemy from the right flank. There was a profound hush as both armies stood for a while motionless on the brink of the river, as if in awe of what was to come. Then Alexander himself, at the head of the right wing of the army, with trumpets blaring and the shout going up to the god of battle, moved forward into the river. It seemed the act of a desperate madman rather than a prudent commander to charge into a swiftly flowing river which swept men off their feet and surged about them and then to advance through a hail of missiles toward the steep bank, which was strongly defended by infantry and cavalry. But in spite of this, Alexander pressed forward. He was foolhardy, but there was a method in his madness. One of the things about leading from the front rather than the rear is that it really makes people follow you. You're not asking them to do anything that you're not doing yourself. There are many historical accounts about what happened here at the Granicus. Suspiciously, none of them agree except that it was an extremely hard-fought battle. It may be that Alexander's first assault against the Persian bank was beaten back, and he was forced to change his tactics. In propaganda terms, this initial defeat would be disastrous, so perhaps it was hushed up. From a military point of view, it would seem suicidal to send men against determined opposition across this river and up that bank. But it seems that that is exactly what Alexander did. And it may be that the hard-fighting Macedonians, with the advantage of their long pikes, did manage to get a foothold up there. When Alexander reaches the opposite riverbank, he leads a cavalry charge. Alexander is struck on the helmet. He loses his spear and is handed another. He is in the act of killing one Persian noble when another one raises his sword to strike down at Alexander. Just in time, his arm is severed by a Macedonian sword screw. The Persians, by pulling their forces away from the riverbank, have weakened their center, and now the Macedonians can cross the river in strength. Squeezed between the pikes of the phalanx and Alexander's cavalry, the Persians break and run. Against all odds, Alexander defeats the Persian army at Granicus. This was perhaps the greatest stroke that Alexander could have hoped for because when the enemy withdrew from the field, um, he had achieved everything that he wanted to achieve, which was to say, basically, you've totally underestimated me, and I'm going to whip your butt. Alexander's victory at Granicus allows his army to continue its invasion of Persia. General Memnon survives the battle and reports to Persian King Darius, who determines that the next time the two forces meet, he personally will command the Persian troops. <laughs> 334 BC, having defeated Persian forces at the Granicus River and gained control over key Aegean seaports, Alexander moves his army to the city of Gordium, which offers no resistance to the powerful Macedonian army. Since 1950, Gordium has been excavated by archeologists from the University of Pennsylvania. Walls of the city, remnants of houses, even the entrance through which Alexander once passed have all been preserved. In Alexander's time, this great walled citadel of Gordium is a vital link on the royal road that leads deep into the heart of the Persian Empire. 
When the all-conquering Alexander arrives at the gates, they are thrown open to him, and he decides to wait here for reinforcements. 400 years earlier, Gordium had been the city of King Midas. Now, Alexander had been educated in the gardens of Midas, so he must have known the local legend. Gordius, Midas's father, had also come here from Macedonia, but he had arrived in an ox cart. When Gordias became king, he dedicated the ox cart here in the shrine of Zeus. Now, the shaft of the cart was connected to the yoke by a great knot, the ends of which were invisible. It was said that whoever could untie this knot would be the ruler of Asia. This is a time in which people absolutely believe in gods, in legends, and in symbols, and this is a great symbol. Once Alexander has publicly accepted this challenge, he has to succeed. He looks at the knot, but like everyone else, he can't see how to untie it. Then, as usual, Alexander thinks out of the box. He says, it doesn't matter how the knot is loosened. He draws his sword and cuts the Gordian knot. He hacks away at the knot until he opens it up. And then he finds the ends and unties it. Now, some people say this is cheating, but that night a great thunderstorm breaks over Gordium. Alexander believes that Zeus approves. Some modern-day historians believe Alexander's experience at Gordium reflects his mastery of the art of public relations as much as his religious fervor. Alexander was a master at the photo op. When there was a, a time when he could use it for propaganda purposes or for PR purposes, he did it. And, and he used it primarily to impress his army, but also to impress the people over whom he, he was to rule. For Alexander's troops, there has never been a time of higher troop morale. But the most difficult tests are yet to come. Upon leaving Gordium, Alexander heads south when he learns that Persian King Darius is personally leading a massive army towards Issus to halt Alexander's conquest. Darius's troops have been estimated to number 600,000, but most historians agree that 60 to 100,000 is far more likely. Nevertheless, Alexander's troops, 30 to 40,000 strong, are severely outnumbered. Despite the advantage the size of his army provides him, Darius seeks counsel from one of his most trusted generals. Roman historian Curtius Rufus described the encounter. Persian King Darius turned to Charidemus, who was an experienced soldier, and proceeded to ask whether he was well enough equipped to crush his enemy. Charidemus answered, your magnificent army can strike terror into your neighbors. It gleams with purple and gold. The Macedonian lion is certainly coarse and inelegant, but protects behind its shield tough, densely packed soldiers. When they are tired, the earth is their bed, and their sleeping time is of shorter duration than the darkness. What you need is strength like theirs. Send off your gold and silver and hire soldiers. Darius, unable to take the truth, had Charidemus dragged off to execution. Darius is confident that the Persian army under his personal command will defeat Alexander. But to give himself even greater advantage, Darius makes a strategic move that takes Alexander by surprise. The Macedonians anticipate Darius attacking from the south. Alexander moves his forces south from his Issus base camp to await the Persian army. But then, Alexander receives startling news. Undetected, Darius moves his army north through a mountain pass and captures Issus, severing Alexander's supply lines. Darius is now preparing to attack from the north. Alexander has no choice but to reverse his direction. It is November 333 BC, 
when Alexander finds his enemy waiting on the opposite bank of the river Pinarus, where it meets the Mediterranean Sea. This is the location today, the shoreline to the west and the hills to the east. Alexander halts his army several hundred yards before the river, though Darius gave his army a great advantage by cutting off the Macedonians from their supplies. Geography is in Alexander's favor. With the sea limiting one flank and the hills the other, there is less chance that the smaller Macedonian army can be completely surrounded by Persian forces. Alexander surveys the situation. A huge body of men was sighted in the distance. Alexander ordered his men to pitch camp just where they were. He was delighted that the issue would be decided there in the pass. However, his confidence gave way to worry. Only a single night now separated him from a critical event. While his victory might be in doubt, one thing was quite certain, that he would die an honorable death, which would bring him great praise. When we consider Alexander in all his battles, one of the things, obviously, we have to take into account is how did he feel about it? Was he afraid? And to be honest, in just about every case, I see no evidence of any fear whatsoever. Did he have any fears? He may have had fears. Does he act like he had any fears? No. He is one of the few people that I can say in history that I have examined who acts with supreme confidence. The lines are drawn for what will be known as the Battle at Issus. Like the Granicus River, the Pinarus now becomes the Persian army's primary defense. Darius aligns infantry and cavalry along the riverbank and in a flanking position at the foothills. Riding in his chariot, Darius takes a central position from where he can observe the action and dispatch orders. Alexander prepares to do what he does best, anticipate, react, and adapt. Darius believes that his huge force of cavalry will win the battle, so sensibly he places them here on the flat ground by the Mediterranean seashore. This is Alexander's left wing, where his Macedonian infantry are led by his trusted general Parmenio. But at the last minute, Alexander sees where the Persian blow will fall, so he reinforces this area with his allied cavalry. As Alexander's army advances, hordes of Persian cavalry strike hard. The Macedonian left wing holds, but just barely. An even more serious situation is developing further inland, at the center of the battle. The troops sent forward into the midst of the Persians were now totally surrounded. Obliged to fight hand to hand, they swiftly drew their swords. Then the blood really flowed. The two lines were so closely interlocked that they were striking each other's weapons with their own and driving their blades into their opponent's faces. Only by bringing down his opponent could each man advance. Exhausted as they were, they were continually being met by a fresh adversary. And the wounded could not retire from the battle as on other occasions because the enemy were bearing down on them in front while their own men were pushing them from behind. Even Alexander's powerful phalanx is in peril at Issus. Now the phalanx has one great weakness. This rough ground. In this kind of terrain, it's impossible to keep the ranks level and the files tightly packed. And as the Macedonians stumble across the riverbed, gaps open up in their phalanx. Darius's Greeks tear into the disordered Macedonians, who desperately try and keep their formations together. Here in the center, the Macedonian phalanx is stopped. They're in serious trouble. in November of 333 BC is critical to Alexander's conquest of Asia, but his army is outnumbered by the forces of Persian King Darius. 
rough ground hinders the progress of the legendary Macedonian phalanx and infantry, which find themselves engaged in the bloodiest of hand-to-hand -hand combat. The only chance for Macedonian victory lies with the cavalry, led by Alexander himself. Alexander was as much a soldier as a commander. Riding high in his chariot, Darius cut a conspicuous figure. His brother, Oxathres, saw Alexander bearing down on Darius and moved the cavalry under his command right in front of the king's chariot. Then the carnage truly took on cataclysmic proportions. Around Darius's chariot lay his most famous generals who had succumbed to a glorious death before the eyes of their king and who now all lay where they had been fighting. Persian King Darius begins to panic, but the battle is far from over. Alexander turns his attention to his bloodied and beaten phalanx and infantry, still bravely trying to hold their ground. At this point, Alexander alone holds the key to victory or defeat. The usual problem with cavalry is that once you let it go, it's gone. That infantry running away there is a perfect target for cavalry, and just beyond them is the Persian camp with all its loot. But Alexander has sufficient command to stop his cavalry charge, and the control to regroup them, turn them left, and smash into the Persian center. Here, Darius himself is directly attacked by Alexander. Too late, Darius discovers that the Macedonian's strongest force is their cavalry. In the savage fighting that follows, Alexander himself is wounded in the thigh. Darius, as he sees his royal bodyguard being cut to pieces, turns his chariot round and runs for his life. The Persian line folds up, and as evening falls, their retreat becomes a rout. Following this battle in late 333 BC, Alexander receives word that Darius's mother, wife, and two unmarried daughters are among those taken prisoner, and that they wrongly believe that Darius has been killed. When he heard this, Alexander sent word to them that Darius was not dead, and that they need have no fear of Alexander. He was fighting Darius for the empire of Asia, but they should be provided with everything they had been accustomed to when Darius was king. Alexander allowed them to keep the same attendance and privileges they had previously enjoyed and even increased their revenues. And what he's doing is presenting himself as the next Persian king. He is the legitimate Persian king and it is his duty to take care of the women folk. And by doing that, he's sending out a huge message to the rest of the world that I have the Persian women, I am the Persian king, the Persian nobles are coming over to me. For Alexander the Great, the victory at Issus in 333 BC is a dramatic turning point. He has defeated the most powerful army in the world led by the most powerful ruler. Alexander continues his conquest of the Asiatic seaports. Cyprus and Phoenicia come easily under his control. During this time, Alexander receives a letter from Persian King Darius. Darius appealed to Alexander to accept ransom for his Persian prisoners. He further offered him all the territory west of the Euphrates and the hand of one of his daughters in marriage, and on these terms proposed that they should become friends and allies. Alexander told his companions of this offer, whereupon Parmenio said, I would accept these terms if I were Alexander. So would I, by Zeus, retorted Alexander, if I were Parmenio. Alexander wrote his reply to Darius. First, I defeated your generals. Now I have defeated yourself and the army you led. In the future, let any communication you wish to make with me be addressed to the king of all Asia. Do not write to me as an equal. Everything you possess is now mine. If you wish to dispute your throne, 
stand and fight for it, and do not run away. Wherever you may hide yourself, be sure I shall seek you out. Alexander, his communications with Darius only fueling his desire for conquest, leads his army toward the naval center of Tyre. Alexander wishes to control Tyre because of its strategic location. The older part of the city is on the mainland, but a half a mile offshore is a heavily walled, impregnable island, also considered part of Tyre. I'm standing on the southern edge of the island of Tyre. Later, earthquakes caused this area to slip into the sea, but this line of rocks marks where the ancient walls of the city once stood. Behind me was the southern harbor, one of two harbors in which the Tyrians kept their navy. If Alexander had his own ships, he could have mounted an amphibious assault from the sea. But more than a year earlier at Miletus, he'd taken the bold decision to disband his own ships and defeat the Persian fleet from the land by destroying its harbors and its bases of supply. Among the most important of those was Tyre itself. Controlling the island of Tyre means controlling the vast naval harbor. When Alexander arrives in January of 332 BC, the king of Tyre is away serving with the Persian fleet. Tyrian envoys are sent to determine Alexander's desires. At first, Alexander tries diplomacy. This later Roman arch is close to where the old shoreline was. Here, the Tyrians come to greet Alexander. He tells them he wishes to visit their island to sacrifice at the temple of Heracles. The Tyrians know that to allow Alexander in means a surrender of the city to him. So they politely point out that there is a perfectly good temple of Heracles here on the mainland. Alexander is reported to have become furious and to say, I will show you that your island is part of the mainland. He must have known then there was only one way to conquer Tyre. To the amazement of the Tyrians and even his own army, Alexander threatens to conquer the walled city in a manner unimaginable, even today, by building a mole or causeway one half mile long to connect the island to the mainland. Alexander himself has no idea how difficult it will be to accomplish such a bold endeavor. When Alexander the Great encounters unexpected resistance to his desire to conquer the walled island of Tyre, his plan of action to build a mole or causeway, allowing him to lay siege to the city, bewilders even his own men. The sight of the fathomless deep filled the soldiers with despair for it could scarcely be filled even if they had divine aid. How could rocks big enough be found, or trees tall enough? To make a mound to fill such a void, they would have to denude whole regions. The strait was perpetually stormy, and the more constricted the area of its movement between the island and the mainland, the more fierce it became. The Tyrians view Alexander's plan as absurd and consider the threat an idle one. How did the people of Tyre have the confidence to resist Alexander? Well, Tyre was a mighty city. These Roman remains are from the first and third centuries AD, but down here are some of the original fortifications of the city from Alexander's time. These stone blocks are around 2,500 years old. They formed part of the massive walls and towers which then surrounded the city. 300 years before Alexander's time, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon laid siege to this place for 13 years in succession. He failed to conquer it. So this is the outside wall. Ali Badawi is chief archaeologist at the ruins of Tyre. He explains that during Alexander's time, two walls separated by approximately six feet of space protected the island. 
the foundation for the outer wall was below sea level. They took in consideration if somebody is going to invade the, the island, he will try to look for a small piece of land to land the army and to start the attack on the wall. So for this reason, when they built the walls of the city, they built it just in the edge of the rock at that time. So next to it, you have just the sea. As his troops prepare to construct the mole, Alexander hopes the mere sight of his army's determination will influence the leaders of Tyre. He tries one more effort at conquest by diplomacy. Alexander sent heralds to urge the Tyrians to accept peace terms. But the latter, violating international conventions, killed them and threw their bodies into the sea. Outraged by the disgraceful murder of his men, Alexander resolved to lay siege to the city. The massive task of building the mole begins in January 332 BC, with large quantities of rock being transported from old mainland Tyre and timber from a nearby mountain. Little by little, the mole began to rise above the surface and the mound's width increased as it approached the city. But as the mole proceeded further from the shore, the materials piled on it were increasingly sucked into the sea's depths. With their light skiffs, the Tyrians began to encircle the structure, attacking with missiles the men standing by the work. Alexander had hides and sheets of canvas stretched before the workmen to screen them from the missiles. And he erected two turrets on top of the mole from which weapons could be directed at approaching boats. As the structure of the mole finally reaches close to the walled island, the Tyrians make their boldest move. The Tyrians fill a ship with combustible material. From the bows, they hang pots of what was probably naphtha, a sort of napalm of ancient times. They tow the ship towards the mole and set fire to it. The pots of naphtha burst, and the siege towers and wooden palisades catch fire. Simultaneously, they attack with small boats from both sides, killing Alexander's workers and defenders. The attack is a complete success. Alexander's mole is a pile of smoking rubble. Undaunted, Alexander sets his soldiers to work building a new mole. But he also comes to realize that Tyre can only be taken by siege, waged simultaneously from land and sea. In July 332 BC, the second mole is finally ready. So are warships obtained from nearby Cyprus. As the Macedonian infantry attacks the walls of Tyre from the mole, Alexander leads forces across gangways from the ships. A Macedonian commander named Admetus leads the assault and pays for it with his life. Alexander himself takes his place, and after bitter fighting, his men break through and gain a small part of the wall. It is all they need. I am standing on the inner defensive walls of Tyre, and here, sure enough, the archaeologists have found a small breach in the wall. They believe that it is in this place that the Macedonians poured through the defenses. They cut down the exhausted Tyrians, drove them north into the main part of the city, attacked from the land and the sea. Tyre could not hold. The Siege of Tyre by Alexander's troops takes seven months. Truth of the matter is that in the end, he went through with it because he was damn well not going to be beaten, um, because they had really irritated him past belief, and because he was going to f sac sacrifice in that damn temple if he had to kill 10,000 people to do it. Some Tyrians made a hopeless last stand at their citadel, the Agonorium. Others fled for their lives here to the Temple of Heracles. Like most ancient sites, this one has been built over. A medieval cathedral was constructed on top of it. But down here was the old temple. 
Here, Alexander comes to finally make his sacrifice to Heracles after seven bloody months. Those found in here are spared, but outside these walls, a terrible massacre takes place. 8,000 Tyrians are slaughtered, 30,000 more sold into slavery. Today, this roadway is built literally on top of the mole constructed by order of Alexander. His unrelenting, successful siege of Tyre sent a message to every other city in the path of his future conquests. What Alexander proves is that if he believes something is strategically necessary, he will stay at it and fight for as long as it takes in order to attain that goal. Conquering the walled island city of Tyre has gone down in history as one of the most incredible achievements of any army. Alexander, more confident than ever in the abilities of his troops and himself, continues toward the goal of defeating King Darius and conquering Persia. But first, he sets out to discover something even more personally significant, proof that he is not only a man, but a god. In 332 BC, following a seven-month siege, Alexander has achieved what most would consider impossible, the conquest of the walled island city of Tyre by building not one, but two half-mile-long causeways. With the Aegean seaport under his control, Alexander confidently leads his army into Egypt. There, he is given the title of Pharaoh, by tradition making him both a king and a son of Ra, or God. After traveling through Heliopolis and Memphis, Alexander comes upon a shoreline so magnificent, he envisions a grand seaport. Alexandria is the first of more than 30 cities founded by Alexander in his own name. But why here? Well, it's an excellent location between Lake Mariotis and the Mediterranean Sea. It has a mild, healthy climate and an excellent natural harbor, deep and well sheltered, further improved when Alexander commands the offshore island of Pharos to be connected to the mainland by a mole. Alexandria would be the new emporium for the world's trade, a cornerstone for Alexander's empire and a crossroads of the ancient world. Today, the population of Alexandria is approximately 4 million. 80% of Egypt's imports and exports move through its harbors. To many, building such a city would be an achievement of a lifetime. But for Alexander the Great, it is merely a brief distraction from greater priorities. One of those is a visit to the temple of the god Amon, at the desert oasis of Siwa. While Alexander was in Egypt, the entire resources of the greatest empire on earth were mobilizing to fight him. He had to get back to war to defeat the Persians before their vast armies cut him off from Macedonia. But at this crucial moment, he chose to spend six weeks traveling through the Sahara Desert. The journey was a spiritual preparation for what was perhaps the greatest religious experience of Alexander's life. And it was a journey that nearly killed him. When Alexander came to the desert, he began to cross a country covered with an infinite expanse of sand. In four days, their water had given out. And they suffered from fearful thirst. All fell into despair. And suddenly, a great storm of rain burst from the heavens ending their shortage of water in a way that had not been foreseen. At one point, when the road could not be traced because of the sand dunes, the guide pointed out to the king that the crows calling on the right were calling their attention to the route which led to the temple. Alexander took this as an omen, and thinking that the god was pleased by his visit, pushed on with speed. To the Egyptians, Amon was the equivalent of the Greek god Zeus, the king of all gods. Frequently, 
the deity would be addressed using both names, Zeus Amon. Alexander has a burning desire to find out from the oracle at Siwa if he is a son of God. Today, the remains of the temple still stand at Siwa Oasis. Alexander and his companions climbed up into the temple, and it was here on these steps that the high priest greeted Alexander with a slip of the tongue. He meant to say, O Pai Dion, O my son. But his Greek wasn't up to much, and what the Macedonians heard him say was, O Pai Dios, O son of Zeus. Now for Alexander, that was quite a good start. The sayings of the oracle were usually delivered in this courtyard, but Alexander was too important a guest for a public show. Besides, he had some very private questions. So he alone was allowed to question the god directly and enter the inner chamber. This is the holy shrine where the bejeweled statue of the ram-headed god Amon was kept. Alexander stood here alone on this very spot to ask his questions. He never revealed what they were, but in later years they were said to be these. Would he conquer the world? Had all his father's murderers been punished? And was he indeed the son of Zeus? Alexander received his answers from the priests, who supposedly had not heard the questions. But in fact, beside this chamber is a narrow passageway. Here, the priests could listen in and then appear to give the gods answers. Now, it's easy for us to mock this as a fraud, but remember, oracles don't last for 2,000 years unless they're pretty accurate. The answers that Alexander received were these. Yes, he would conquer the world. Yes, all his father's murderers had been punished, which may have been a relief to Alexander, if he was in fact guilty of involvement in his father's death, he needed to know if divine retribution was on the way. The answer to the final question was clear. The priests told him that Philip was not his father anyway, and that he was indeed the son of Zeus Ammon, the son of God. No one is with Alexander when the priests at Siwa supposedly acknowledge him as the son of God. There are no witnesses, only the word of Alexander himself. But as Alexander heads back through the desert to rejoin his army, his belief in his own invincibility is heightened. He would need every bit of this confidence in the months and years ahead. Alexander still faces a decisive battle with perhaps the only other mortal who might have considered himself a deity. Darius and the Persian king is preparing a secret weapon for their next encounter, designed to render Alexander's most powerful war machine, the phalanx, useless. Fall 331 BC. Despite dramatic victories at the Granicus River, Issus and Tyre, Alexander the Great realizes he can never claim to rule Asia if King Darius remains free. And Darius realizes he will never retain control of Asia without defeating Alexander. The two commanders know an ultimate showdown must take place. Darius chooses the location, camping his forces at the River Bomelos, near the village of Gagumela. None of Alexander's battles is better documented by ancient historians than the Battle of Gagamela. Darius assembled his forces and made everything ready for battle. He had fashioned swords and lances much longer than his earlier types. He had also constructed 200 scythe-bearing chariots, well designed to astonish and terrify the enemy. From each of these were projected out beyond the trace horses, size nearly a meter in length, presenting their cutting edges to the front. The night before the battle, several miles of rolling hills separate the two armies. 
Alexander's chief general Parmenio and several of his most prominent officers move forward to survey the enemy position. They were filled with amazement at the sight and remarked to one another that it would have been a very difficult task to defeat an enemy of such strength by engaging him by day. They therefore went to Alexander to persuade him to attack by night so as to conceal from his men the most terrifying element in the coming struggle, that is the odds against them. It was then that Alexander gave him his celebrated answer. I will not steal my victory. He was determined that if Darius were defeated, he should have no cause to summon up courage for another attempt. He was not to be allowed to blame darkness and night for his failure on this occasion. As at Issus, he had blamed the narrow mountain passes and the sea. And there is this account of how he sat there at night into the darkness, figuring out strategy and tactics, finally got what he wanted. And this is the point. Then just fell into a totally undisturbed sleep. And he slept on. And he said, till I got it figured out, I was worried. After that, I was fine. The army got up in the morning, the valley was sounded. Alexander slept on like a baby until finally his staff officers had to wake him. At this point, Alexander gives his troops the pep talk of their lives, confidently telling them that this battle would decide who would rule the continent of Asia. On the other side of the battlefield, the Persian king Darius is giving a speech of his own. But his mood is more of desperation than of confidence. He tells his troops, today will consolidate or terminate an empire greater than any age has seen. Now, it is not glory for which you must fight, it is survival. Our backs are to the wall. I beg you by our country's gods, deliver the Persian people and its honor from the depths of disgrace. Slowly but methodically, Alexander's phalanx marches forward in formation to encounter Darius's new rolling weapons. The scythe chariot swung into action at full gallop and created great alarm and terror among the Macedonians. As the phalanx joined shields, however, all beat upon their shields with their spears as the king had commanded, and a great din arose. In some instances, the horses were killed by javelin casts, and in others, they rode through and escaped. But some of them, using the full force of their momentum and applying their steel blades actively, wrought death among the Macedonians in many and various forms. They severed the arms of many, shields and all, and in no small number of cases, cut through nets and sent heads tumbling to the ground with the eyes still open and the expression of the countenance unchanged. And in other cases, they sliced through ribs with mortal gashes and inflicted a quick death. Facing a king and his army, fighting with superhuman strength and passion to retain control of Asia, Alexander's soldiers find themselves, for the first time, struggling not to win, but simply to survive. The situation looks horribly bleak for the Macedonian general Parmenio, who heroically attempts to maintain order in a valiant struggle with his infantry. He realizes there is only one person who has the capacity to turn the tide of battle, Alexander himself. But Alexander is preoccupied personally fighting his way toward the chariot bearing King Darius. Alexander has sighted his adversary through the ranks of cavalry who were closely massed to guard the lofty chariot in which he stood. The bravest stood fast and were slaughtered in front of their king. They fell upon one another in heaps. As for Darius, all the horrors of the battle were now before his eyes. It had become difficult to turn his chariot around and drive it away. 
since the wheels were encumbered and entangled with bodies. The king abandoned his chariot and his armor, mounted a mare and rode away. It is believed that he would have not have escaped at the moment had not Parmenio sent another party of horsemen, begging Alexander to come to his rescue. When this news was brought to Alexander, he turned back again from further pursuit and wheeling round with the companion cavalry, led them with great speed against the right wing of Darius's horsemen. Then ensued the most obstinately contested cavalry fight in the whole engagement. Here about 60 of Alexander's companions fell, but Darius's troops were overcome by Alexander, and as many of them as could force their way through his ranks fled with all their might. What may have first appeared to be impending doom for Alexander proves to be yet another episode confirming Alexander's genius as a commander. Realizing that Darius is relying not on his infantry, but massed squadrons of heavily armed horsemen, Alexander tempts both of Darius's cavalry wings to charge his echelon flanks. Alexander hopes that the flanks can hold out just long enough to create a gap in the Persian line, allowing Alexander's companion cavalry to punch through, which they do with perfect timing. Historians past and present consider the strategy masterful. Alexander had a tactical brilliance there. The only thing that one can perhaps criticize is that he left the battlefield in pursuit of Darius, trying to get hold of him alive. Alexander wheels around and starts off in pursuit of Darius once more, keeping up the chase as long as there is daylight. Parmenio's brigade also follows, but when darkness falls, Alexander stops to rest his men and horses. Darius continues to ride away, leaving behind his chariot, spear, and bow. Again, Darius escapes. Although the Macedonian army is grossly outnumbered, the casualty figures reported by historians are nothing short of astounding. Some say incredible. Of Alexander's men, about 100 were killed, and more than 1,000 of his horses were lost, either from wounds or from fatigue in the pursuit. Of Darius's forces, there were said to have been 300,000 slain and far more were taken prisoner than were killed. The Battle of Gagamela leaves no doubt that Persia is now under Alexander's control. But of far greater importance for the warrior king is the capture of King Darius. Alexander knows Darius will be far more valuable governing Persia under his command than as a deceased ruler. But would he be able to capture the fallen king alive? Alexander's victory at the Battle of Gagamela is viewed by many as the most significant triumph in his conquest of Asia. After the battle had ended in this way, the authority of the Persian Empire was regarded as having been completely overthrown. Alexander was proclaimed King of Asia, and after offering splendid sacrifices to the gods, he proceeded to reward his friends with riches, estates, and governorships. Within four months of his victory at Gagamela, in January of 330 BC, Alexander takes over Darius's palace and the city of Persepolis in ancient Persia. Now, all of Persia, its capital city, and literally tons of gold and silver bullion belong to Alexander. The minimum estimate is of 180,000 talents of it. And you have to remember that a talent is 57 and a half pounds weight. This made him the richest man in the known world. He could do what he liked. 
He could call himself God if he wanted. It's like taking over the whole of Fort Knox one afternoon, and that treasure was evacuated and sent in a great bullion train escorted by 6,000 Macedonians. Alexander described Persepolis to the Macedonians as the most hateful of the cities of Asia and gave it over to his soldiers to plunder. The Macedonians raced into it, slaughtering all the men whom they met and plundering the residences. Such was their exceeding lust for loot that they fought with each other and killed many of their fellows who had appropriated a greater portion of it. Some cut off the hands of those who were grasping at disputed property, being driven mad by their passions. Basking in the spoils of victory, Alexander remains with his army at Persepolis four months before continuing his conquest of Asia. Alexander had some great natural gifts, but all those were marred by his inexcusable fondness for drink. At a daytime drinking party, a courtesan claimed that if Alexander gave the order to burn the Persian palace, he would earn the deepest gratitude among the Greeks. The king was enthusiastic. Why do we not revenge Greece then and put the city to the torch? Alexander took the lead, setting fire to the palace to be followed by his drinking companions. Such was the end of the palace that ruled all the east. The Macedonians were ashamed that a city of such distinction had been destroyed by their king during a drunken orgy. As for Alexander, it is generally agreed that when sleep had brought him back to his senses after his drunken bout, he regretted his actions. By the summer of 330 BC, there is little doubt, at least in Alexander's mind, that he rules Asia. But it isn't enough for Alexander to control Darius's kingdom. He passionately continues to pursue Darius, not to kill him, but to take him prisoner. It was, I suppose, the ultimate in legitimizing. The previous ruler recognizes him, not merely as the conqueror, but as the natural monarch of Persia and almost abdicates for him. How long he would have lived after that, we don't know, but I'm sure that was the thinking behind it. The other important reason for getting his hands on Darius, either dead or alive, was to make sure, and alive is better than dead, to make sure that no pretenders pop up. He's fighting against a culture that is used to having pretenders pop up and say, I'm Darius, no, I'm Darius, no, I'm Darius. And the reason why this could occur is because there's no uh, ABC, NBC, CBS, there's no CNN, there's no C-SPAN. The only way you could be absolutely certain that you had gained control of the king of the previous dynasty and say, we're done with this dynasty, is to have him alive in your possession. When Alexander learns Darius is heading north, he again takes up the chase. So rapid was the march that many of the men, unable to stand the pace, dropped out. A number of horses were worked to death but Alexander pressed on regardless of loss. At this juncture, two important persons in Darius's army sought an interview with Alexander. They reported that Darius had been forcibly seized and put under arrest by his own commanders. Bessus, one of his generals, had assumed power in his place. Instantly, Alexander was on the march again with greater rapidity than ever. June 330 BC, Alexander's army marches day and night to catch up with the Persian army under the control of Bessos. Within two weeks, Alexander has the Persian troops in sight. Even though the Persian army is still far greater in number than that of Alexander, thousands of Persian soldiers surrender. Bessos, however, would not allow such a fate for Darius. Bessus and his fellow conspirators came to Darius's wagon and started urging him to mount a horse and flee to escape his enemy. 
Rias, however, declared that the gods had come to avenge him and, calling for Alexander's protection, refused to go along with the traitors. At this, they were furious. They hurled their spears at the king and left him there, run through many times. They also maimed his animals to prevent them advancing any further. Deprived of their leaders, the barbarians scattered wherever hope or panic directed them. With the great and powerful Darius lying severely wounded, only time would dictate whether Alexander would be able to capture him alive. When Alexander's forces finally catch up to the fleeing Persian troops, they find Darius barely clinging to life. They found him at his last gasp. He asked for a drink, and he swallowed some cold water, which a Macedonian brought him. He said, this is the final stroke of misfortune, that I should accept a service from you and not be able to return it. But Alexander will reward you for your kindness, and the gods will repay him for his courtesy towards my mother and my wife and my children. As he said this, he took the Macedonian by the hand and died. When Alexander came up, he showed his grief and distress at the king's death. And unfastening his own cloak, he threw it over the body and covered it. Later, after he captured Bessus, who had murdered the king, Alexander had the tops of two straight trees bent down so that they met, and part of Bessus's body was tied to each. Then when each tree was let go and sprang back to its upright position, the part of the body attached to it was torn off by the recoil. As for Darius's body, he sent it to his mother to be laid out in royal state. With Darius dead, Alexander's conquest will ultimately be assured. But in the ensuing months, Alexander faces new enemies within his own army and within himself. With Persia under Alexander's control and King Darius dead, the mission of Alexander the Great is essentially complete. But Alexander now faces new dilemmas, far more complex than waging war. It's very revealing that it's after Gorgamela that the restlessness among the troops really begins to start on the very reasonable basis that, look, we've done what we were sent, set out to do. We have destroyed the control of the Persian Empire. We've done it. Now let's go home. At this time, Alexander becomes acutely aware of potential threats to his power. Among the Macedonians at this time, few men enjoyed a more prominent position than Philotas, the son of Parmenio. When Darius had been defeated, a beautiful Greek girl named Antigone was handed over to Philotas. He confided to her that all the greatest achievements in this campaign had been the work of his father and himself. Antigone repeated these remarks privately to Alexander. Once the king had begun to listen to these insinuations, Philotas's enemies brought innumerable accusations against them, including conspiracy. Philotas was executed, and immediately afterwards, Alexander had Perminio put to death as well. This was a man who had rendered many great services to Philip and who, of all Alexander's older friends, had urged him more strongly to undertake the invasion of Asia. It is now widely believed that Alexander always had concerns about the loyalty of Parmenio and his son Philotus. For all practical purposes, the account given to him by Antigone gives Alexander the opportunity to take strong action he may have been considering for years. In October 330 BC, Alexander makes his close friend Hephaestion 
joint commander of the Companion Cavalry. The Macedonian army, now on the march for more than seven years, moves towards India, and Alexander's erratic behavior continues. In 327 BC, at the age of 29, Alexander does something that is so out of character, it shocks even his closest associates, particularly his lifelong male companion and rumored lover, Hephaestion. Alexander takes a wife. This is Roxane, the beautiful daughter of Oxiates, a baron whose mountain stronghold of the Sogdian rocks has been captured by Alexander. But why does Alexander marry? Well, it's a good political alliance with the local nobility, and there's a chance of producing a legitimate heir for his vast empire. But some ancient historians write that Alexander may indeed have had genuine romantic feelings for Roxane. Men who took part in the campaign used to say she was the loveliest woman they had seen in Asia. Alexander fell in love with her at sight, but captive though she was, he refused, for all his passion, to force her to his will and condescended to marry her. Alexander confounds his associates even further when he decides that those under his rule should honor an ancient Persian tradition. For the ruler of the Persian Empire, it was essential to be seen to receive proskinesis from his subjects. Now, for the Persians, this is a matter of respect, a simple kiss of the hand. It could be combined with a bow, or with kneeling, or even prostration, face down on the ground. But for the Greeks, this gesture is a form of worship exclusively reserved for the gods. Alexander's command is hotly contested by his followers, and Callisthenes, his official historian, refuses to do it. He speaks boldly to his longtime friend, you should remember Greece. For her sake, you undertook this expedition into Asia. When you return home, will you force the Greeks, the greatest freedom lovers of all, to bow down before you? From this point, Callisthenes loses the favor of Alexander. And as so many have discovered before him, that can be a tragic mistake. Alexander orders Callisthenes, his own historian, to be executed. All it meant to Alexander was that here was this damned intellectual who'd served his purpose and, grew, and was now becoming a, a, becoming a nuisance and was therefore expendable. And being expendable, he was thereupon expended. Alexander's desire to pursue Persian tradition slowly evolves into a life of hedonism. He clearly saw himself as a god, and he was being treated as a god. People have been reluctant to believe this because they think of Alexander through modern lenses. Um, no one these days thinks of himself as a god unless he's nuts. But what of Alexander? Alexander now began to imitate the Persian luxury. He dressed himself in a white robe in a Persian sash. He added concubines to his retinue in the manner of Darius, in numbering not less than the days of the year and outstanding in beauty. Each night, these paraded about the couch of the king so that he might select the one with whom he would lie that night. Alexander could better cope with warfare than peace and leisure. As soon as he was free of these worries that beset him, he yielded to dissipation, and the man whom the arms of Persia had failed to crush fell before its vices. There were parties early in the day, drinking and mad revelry throughout the night. It was a general decline into the ways of the foreigner. By affecting these as though they were superior to those of his own country, Alexander so offended the sensibilities and eyes of his people that most of his friends began to regard him as an enemy. His long-sought conquest of Asia complete, 
Alexander continues to want more. In early 326 BC, he begins a campaign in India, where King Porus attempts to stop him at the river Hydaspes. Alexander's forces find themselves fighting an enemy not riding just horses, but elephants. While the Macedonians prevail, the contest is the most difficult they have fought. A consequence of this battle with Porus was that it blunted the edge of the Macedonians' courage and made them determined not to advance any further into India. At first, Alexander was so overcome with disappointment and anger that he shut himself up and lay prostrate in his tent. His soldiers crowded around the entrance and pleaded with him uttering loud cries and lamentations until finally he relented and gave orders to break camp. Alexander was now eager to see the outer ocean. He had a large number of oar propelled ferries and rafts constructed and was rowed down the rivers on these at a leisurely speed. But his voyage was by no means a peaceful affair. As Alexander travels downstream, he will land, assault the cities near the banks, and subdue them all. Then comes the walled city of Mali, home of the independent tribe of Malians. Alexander neared the city and thought to take it by storm. One of the seers came to him and reported that there had been revealed to him a great danger which would come to the king from a wound in the course of the operation. He begged Alexander to leave the city alone for the present and to turn his mind to other activities. The king scolded him for dampening the enthusiasm of the soldiers, and then, disposing his army for the attack, led the way in person to the city, eager to reduce it by force. Alexander stationed his infantry in a ring around the outer defenses and moved up in close formation. The defenders took refuge in their inner stronghold. Here, they continued to resist, and not without success, for they turned and fell upon a small party of Macedonians, driving some of them out again and killing about 25 before they could get away. Alexander, meanwhile, brought the scaling ladders into position all around the inner stronghold. But the men with the ladders are too slow for Alexander. Impatiently, he grabs one himself, leans against the fortress wall, and is the very first to climb to the top, cutting down at the enemy left and right, until suddenly, Alexander stands alone. To the horror of his men down below, he is now a perfect target for enemy archers. What he should do now is go back, jump down to rejoin his men. But what he does do is jump forward inside the enemy fortress, where, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, he fights for his life. Horrified, the Macedonians rush for the walls in such numbers, they break their own ladders. Only three of them manage to join him inside the fortress, including the bearer of Alexander's Trojan shield. Two of the Macedonians are cut down by the enemy, and Alexander himself receives an arrow, which penetrates his body armor and pierces his lung. The fourth Macedonian defends his leader with the great shield of Troy. Desperately, Alexander's army finally manages to scale the walls and they witness an impossible sight. Their invincible leader lying on the ground in a pool of blood. For Alexander, Leading the charge to take on the enemy at Mali in 326 BC is nothing new. The wound he receives is but one of several he suffers on the fields of battle. But for the seemingly invincible warrior, this injury is different. Alexander's troops realize it is life-threatening. Immediately, the rumor ran through the camp that Alexander had been killed. Meanwhile, his attendants, with great difficulty, sawed off the wooden shaft of the arrow and thus succeeded in removing his breastplate. They then had to cut out the arrowhead, which was embedded between his ribs. 
When it was extracted, the king fainted away and came very near to death. Even when the danger was past, he remained weak and for a long time needed careful nursing. Slowly, Alexander recuperates. During the next two years, he heads his army west back towards Greece, half by land, half by sea. In July of 324 BC, Alexander suffers an even deeper hurt. His close friend Hephaestion dies of an unknown illness. Alexander is devastated. We are told that Alexander flung himself on the body of his friend and lay there nearly all day long in tears and refused to be parted from him until he was dragged away. Some have said that he had Hephaestion's doctor hanged for giving the wrong medicine. All the accounts agree that for two whole days after Hephaestion's death, Alexander tasted no food and paid no attention in any way to his bodily needs, but lay on his bed, crying. I think Hephaestion, because of his close personal relationship with Alexander, was one of these confidants. And when Alexander lost him, he, he lost a very, very close ally. Uh, in developing policy. And you might even say that he begins to go downhill after Hephaestion's death, uh, that he shows signs of, um, of, of losing some, some will after Hephaestion's death. Less than one year after Hephaestion dies, Alexander rests in Babylon, planning a possible conquest of Arabia when he too becomes ill. During a 10-day period, what begins as a mild fever evolves into a mysterious, life-threatening illness. The soldiers were passionately eager to see him. Some hoped for a sight of him while he was still alive. Others wished to see his body, for a report had gone round that he was already dead, and they suspected that his death was being concealed by his guards. But nothing could keep them from a sight of him and the motive in almost every heart was grief and a sort of helpless bewilderment at the thought of losing their king. It is at this critical moment when the enormity of Alexander's influence is acutely felt by all who know him. It is my belief that there was in those days no nation, no city, no single individual beyond the reach of Alexander's name. Never in all the world was there another like him. And therefore I cannot but feel that some power more than human was concerned in his birth. I have admittedly found fault with some of the things which Alexander did. But of the man himself, I'm not ashamed to express ungrudging admiration. It is also at this moment when Alexander's officers begin to question what will happen if Alexander dies. Who would rule the conquered territories? The prospect of ruling such a vast empire without Alexander is a daunting one. There is no doubt among Alexander's officers that no single human being could ever take his place. The territories would have to be divided they also know that if Alexander himself does not proclaim who will inherit which regions, fierce jealousy would rear its ugly head, resulting in wars between the very leaders who fought united under the banner of one mighty king. Would Alexander be able to defeat his illness, resume his conquest, and lead his loyal forces to even greater glory? Or would he finally prove that he is not the immortal son of Zeus by dying the death of a mere mortal? Late in the evening of June the 9th, 323 BC, a group of Alexander's officers keep vigil as their king's condition worsens. He tells them, I foresee a great funeral battle over me. 
Towards the end, they gather round his bedside to ask the critical question, to whom will he bequeath his kingdom? Weakly, Alexander whispers his last words, Kratisto, to the strongest. Early in the morning of June the 10th, his eyes close forever. For centuries, historians have debated the cause of Alexander's death, from alcoholism to poisoning to compulsive self-destruction. If we're asking what killed him, you've got a whole smorgasbord to pick from. And again, funnily enough, it might be a case of all things conspiring together. He never really got over that terrible shovel-headed arrow wound that he got in India. That really nearly killed him. There is also the probably endemic malaria, um, whatever disease it was that he had um, during his last days. I feel that Alexander died ultimately because he pushed himself too hard. With Alexander, um, he has this wonderful uh, military campaign and then dies. Well, for him, that's kind of a good thing for him because I, I'm not sure he would have been real good as an administrator. Again, it comes back to your own personal uh, opinion about what exactly made Alexander so great. Uh, but my feeling is that Alexander would have pushed himself until he died or burned out. And, and I think that had it not happened in 323, it would have happened in 321, or it would have happened in 320. I don't see Alexander mellowing out and living into an old age. Just as in life, Alexander was a powerful figure, so too in death. His corpse, while en route home to Greece, finds its final resting place instead in Alexandria, Egypt. In the chaos that follows Alexander's death, his embalmed body becomes a major asset. Alexander had said that he wished to be buried at Siwa with his spiritual father, the god Zeus Amon. But the Macedonians want their noble leader to be buried at home. As the body is being transported by land in a golden sarcophagus, it is hijacked by soldiers under the command of Alexander's former general Ptolemy, now the new ruler of Egypt. Controlling the body of Alexander lends new power to the reputation of Ptolemy and his successors. For several hundred years, Alexander's sarcophagus is viewed here by thousands, including Julius Caesar. But when the Ptolemaic pharaohs fall from power after the death of Cleopatra, they lose control of Alexander's remains. Today, no one is certain exactly where the remains of Alexander are located. Most agree they are buried beneath the streets of Alexandria, most probably near the Mosque of Daniel. The mosque is very active, with prayer services held every day. If Alexander the Great was indeed buried somewhere near the Mosque of Daniel, then it's likely that he would have been brought here, part of the labyrinth of tunnels underneath all of Alexandria. These were designed as systems for the storage of water, and this particular one is directly underneath the mosque. This is believed to be a holy place where the bodies of religious leaders have long been buried. Many attempts have been made to find Alexander's remains, but so far, none have come even close to success. The death of Alexander the Great brings to a close a conquest never again equaled by any warrior at any time in history. The statistics alone are staggering. One man leading 40,000 soldiers by foot and horseback, more than 20,000 miles over 12 years. The vast kingdom which Alexander fought so hard to build over a 12-year period ultimately becomes divided among more than 20 rulers. 
Today, historians, scholars, and soldiers continue to debate the complex character of King Alexander of Macedon. Why do we call him Alexander the Great? Most agree he was the finest military commander that ever lived. He also created a cultural exchange between East and West that became a pivotal point in human history. But he gained his empire at a huge cost of death and destruction. If he had lived, how much further would he have gone? Perhaps we are fortunate that we will never know. At the end of his short life, Alexander was walking a fine line between genius and insanity. Alexander gives an example to the world of a general, the likes of which we have never seen since. Every major general compares himself to Alexander, and I think most every major general feels that somehow he falls short of Alexander. Alexander himself was so powerful a figure that during his lifetime, men who afterwards became great kings, marshals, and leaders. While he lived, they were no more than senior officers, lions to his lion tamer. And even after his death, they were still so scared of him that in council meetings, his crown, his scepter, his royal robe, presided at the head of the table. He was still there for them, even though he was dead. Alexander appears to have had not one moment of self-doubt, not one moment of fear. Whether he was a god or not, he certainly had the confidence of one. He had an absolute vision of his own greatness, and in the end, we are forced to agree with him. He is, and will always remain, Alexander the Great.